Coming up is a renaissance in the works in Gary. Acumen Industries is a California company that produces 5G smartphones. The company says it's moving forward with plans for a new headquarters and manufacturing operation in Gary. It could mean 2,000 jobs. And Mayor Jerome Prince is here and says more big projects are in the works. Digital Leader Academy is bringing the Silicon Valley to Hoosier High Schools. We'll have details on a partnership with Plymouth-based Simba Chain to give high school students one of the most in-demand tech skills. Plus... From coal to craft spirits, I'm Mary Rachel Redmond in Jasonville, where one Fisher Space company is redeveloping a former coal mine into a farm-to-bottle craft distillery. I'll have more from Greene County coming up. And we'll have details on those stories and much more ahead on this edition of Inside Indiana Business. Hello and welcome to Inside Indiana Business. I'm Gary Dick. Well, it's once the epicenter of U.S. steel production, a city with state-of-the-art architecture, cutting-edge entertainment, a growing population, and bustling economy. It was once dubbed the city of the century. Gary's fortunes, though, plummeted with the deterioration of the steel industry in the 70s. The city lost tens of thousands of residents. Decades, the economy really decayed, and infrastructure made national headlines. But there are signs of a comeback in the city known for steel mills and the Jackson 5, including an investment that could mean 2,000 jobs. And I'm pleased to welcome to the show Gary Mayor Jerome Prince with the tales. Mayor Prince, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Gary. Great glad to be here. I want to talk about some of those challenges in a minute, but more and more people are giving Gary a second look. Uh, Alliance Steel uh, moving its uh, headquarters, a steel operation from Illinois to Gary, $120 million investment, uh, well over 100 jobs there. And the big announcement from Acumen, the 5G phone manufacturer, saying they want to put their headquarters and manufacturing operation, the potential for 2,000 jobs in Gary as well. These are big deals uh, that have come to the city. Yeah, without question. And so, uh, again, it's an exciting time for me as a new mayor, you know, outside of all the challenges with the pandemic that myself and practically every other mayor across the country has faced. Uh, there are promising signs that uh, people are taking a second look at Gary and we're doing everything uh, from our side or on our part to make it more attractive and more uh conducive to people wanting to uh, locate here. Yeah. As you look at, I mentioned those two uh, big deals, but additionally, uh, the Hard Rock Casino, a $400 million project uh, expected to open uh, at some point this spring. There have been improvements to Gary Chicago International Airport, which have been a long time coming uh, as well. What is happening? There seems to be a bit of momentum in Gary now with some of these big deals. Why are these things happening now in your view? So I think there are a couple of reasons. Uh, one would be our proximity to the Chicagoland metropolitan area and uh, the ability to uh, commute readily, easily, you know, between the two. Uh, secondly is uh, our overall geographic footprint. I mean, we have rail lines. We uh, obviously have an airport uh, that's here and, and uh, about seven miles of lakefront, which is extremely attractive uh, to persons who are looking for opportunities to uh, reside in a community that has those amenities that we just spoke of, but at a fraction of the price that they probably would realize in the uh, greater metropolitan area. Yeah, as mentioned before, Gary has had some big challenges uh, for decades now, losing population, uh, a lot of negative uh, attention, uh, unfortunately. Do you sense that, that changing? Is that a hurdle that still, still needs to be overcome? Or do you sense that these positive, these economic development deals, maybe you're getting more buy-in from the community now to create a little bit more economic momentum? 
Yeah, so, um, you know, optimistically, I I'd love to say the latter is absolutely true. I do know uh, because we've seen the evidence of it in the form of people actually relocating here uh, from a residential perspective, but also the interest that we've seen in companies wanting to locate or relocate here. And so while uh, a number of the challenges that you mentioned still exist, we believe that people are taking a second serious look at the city. And again, uh, I believe it's incumbent upon this administration and everyone, uh, city buy-in, if you will, to make that as attractive as we possibly can. You know, w w when you mention uh, Acumen, for instance, um, you know, just the fact that a company uh, like of the likes of Acumen would uh, want to develop the first smart technology, nanotechnology within the city and not necessarily look for incentives, which is typically the case as well, uh, bodes extremely well for the city. And we believe that if you get a couple successes like that, uh, you also mentioned Hard Rock Casino. Um, you know, just the increase in traffic to that industry because of its proximity to the highway and being able to actually be seen from there, we yeah. believe is going to bring more and more people into the city. Uh, but uh, on the larger note in terms of challenges, yeah, uh, one of the things that we need to do is to redefine what we've known for in our industry, and we believe that we can do so uh, chasing or at least uh, pursuing technology uh, initiatives such as Acumen. Yeah, I know a big push uh, on your part as well in getting people to live uh, in Gary as part of that broader effort in Northwest Indiana, the double tracking project on the South Shore generational project up there. So a lot of things going on in Northwest Indiana and in particular in Gary and Mayor Jerome Prince. Really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show this week. We look forward to uh, having you on again sometime soon. I'd love to. Thank you, Gary, and All enjoy right. the rest of your day as well. Very good. Well, also this week, big news in Fort Wayne. Construction now imminent for a major redevelopment project that has been years in the making there. Developers of Electric Works say they've closed on a $286 million round of project financing that will transform the former General Electric campus near downtown into a mixed-use innovation district. That funding will support the 12-acre West Campus of Electric Works. Wygan Construction says it's already begun hiring the first of some 2,000 construction-related jobs for the project. Among the major tenants at Electric Works, a new headquarters for Do It Best Corporation, Parkview Health, Fort Wayne Metals, and IU Ventures. Up next, the Indiana connection between coffee beans in Mexico and the University of Notre Dame. Now, a startup from the university's Idea Center is providing key data to identify where and how consumers get their coffee. And now Hoosier High School students are now learning more about the global reach of technology. It's time now to go Inside Innovation, brought to you by Allegion, pioneering safety. Well, the Northern Indiana Digital Leader Academy's partnership with SimbaChain is helping bring blockchain curriculum, one of the most in-demand tech skills, to high school students. This partnership will teach students hands-on skills they can use in college or if they go straight to the workforce once they graduate from high school. And with more on this unique partnership, pleased to be joined by SimbaChain CEO and co-founder Joel Knighty. Also, Digital Leader Academy CEO and co-founder, Ellen Joyce, and welcome to you both. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Joel, I want to start with you. Blockchain technology, many people hear that and their eyes gloss over. Uh, is, as I mentioned, this is regarded as certainly one of, if not the most in-demand tech skills that's out there. Give us a basic definition of what blockchain technology is all about. Sure. It all started with Bitcoin, as we all know, but really it's a digital ledger that everybody shares amongst themselves and that you can immediately, you know, reconcile accounts or various things. So um, it's imagine, you know, just having all these banks and all um, businesses all connected, um, immediately being able to reconcile, not waiting for transactions to um, take days to, to happen. You immediately know that something's 
something's taken place and everybody has access to the ledger. It's all transparency, traceability, all auditable, all those various things. So um, that's really what blockchain is all about. And, um, and we can definitely talk more about that. Yeah. Yeah, Digital Leader Academy is uh, an organization, uh, Ellen, launched out of the Idea Center at Notre Dame. You were a student at Notre Dame when this was all uh, happening. Uh, give us a, a, a snapshot of your organization because you're all about connecting students into this, uh, this tech pipeline. Absolutely. What we do is computer science for the 95% of students who don't want to be software developers. So we bring technology and computer science education into every single classroom, whether it be something like supply chain and logistics, manufacturing, all the way to entrepreneurship and other classes like that. As you look at uh, this partnership, this I know is about, in large part, hands-on uh, experiences for students. Talk about how the partnership will work. Absolutely. So we previously uh, developed an artificial intelligence uh, curricula that was used in a wide variety of classes. We were looking at what is the next emerging technology that we want to tackle. And blockchain, as you mentioned, is one of the most in-demand skills um, in Indiana and throughout the world. So we were looking at, okay, one of the key things for students is to be able to get hands-on. And a lot of our students are students who have been kind of left behind by the system, who are struggling in traditional English and math classes. So one of the key components for them is being able to get involved in the technology. And the problem with blockchain was it's extremely complicated to develop and things like that. However, Simba's platform is so easy to use, it's drag and drop, and it was really the perfect solution to what we were trying to do and trying to bring into the classroom. Very good. Joel, I uh, only have about 30 seconds left, but uh, this is all about, a lot of it is about fueling that pipeline for students who want to go into college, but very importantly, the large uh, number of students who want to go directly from high school into the workplace. Yeah, exactly. We wanted to give them the tools where they could do low code or no code uh, capabilities and so that yeah our drag and drop tools are really powerful that auto generates the code for you so you don't have to have coding skills you just have to have an idea and if you have the idea you can put it together with our easy to use tools all right uh, great success story in northern indiana simba chain doing great things based in plymouth uh, also digital leader academy out of the idea center at notre dame uh, the two connecting uh, thank you both for uh, being on the show this week we look forward to following uh, the progress of this partnership Thank you so much for having us. All right. Yeah, thank you. Well, imagine turning an old abandoned coal mine into a potential gold mine. That's exactly what a Fishers-based company is doing in Greene County. Reporter Mary Rachel Redmond takes us to Jasonville to see how the old Landry mine there is being transformed into a farm-to-bottle distillery. Here's what's making news now around Indiana, brought to you by Chapman Heating, Air Conditioning and Plumbing, the man for all seasons, Chapman, chapmanheating.com. Well, coal contributes an estimated $750 million plus every year to Indiana's economy. But as utility companies all over the U.S. transition to cleaner, burning, lower cost alternative fuels, coal mines everywhere are shutting down, leaving entire communities to struggle in their wake. But one Fishers-based company is on a mission to breathe life back into one former Greene County mine. Around Indiana reporter Mary Rachel Redman has more from Jasonville. Mid-19th century Indiana. The Wabash Valley booming with black gold. It supplied a majority of our power in the region. Um, basically the energy that all of us used in Indianapolis for many years. While coal remains king in Indiana, it's not a question of if but when Hoosier mines are permanently shuttered, like this former Landry mine in Jasonville. This is where the former coal mine was? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the guys, uh, they would, would enter the mine about 15 feet below that water. So looking around, I see up over here, now that looks like coal to me. Mm -hmm. That is. So that was the, there was two coal seams here. This mine alone provided over 100 jobs. The number of coal mines that have went bankrupt in the last three years and the number of people that have lost jobs, what we wanted to do is bring a real solution to a real problem. That solution? 
a farm to table craft distillery. It looks silly ahead of us. Uh huh. That's all going to be flat? It'll, it'll all be flat. The co founders of Land Betterment Corp gave me a tour of the 22 acre property that they acquired over a year ago from a defunct New York hedge fund. So this so old material is just left, not in the right state. You're supposed to do environmental cleanup as you mine coal. You have potential for acid water in the down streams. You have afflicted wildlife. Um, and more importantly, the community can never use a property again. But when they walked away, not only was there post mining cleanup needed, there's five years of excess debris we had to go through. So we'll, we'll move all that to its proper location, which is what they're doing right now with the dozer and our tractor. At the end of the day, not only clean up the environmental problems, but also the job and the tax base problems that the community has. Former coal miners are already chomping at the bit. Meet Joe Wright. He spent the last decade mining at this very site and is grateful for the opportunity. Came, worked in the warehouse, and then went and worked underground for four or five years. It was a, definitely a downturn for the community, but you know, um, hopefully this project will bring them back. And uh, you know, it's different jobs, but it's it's still jobs. It'll, it'll continue my my employment, so <laughs> that's good for me and my family. Not every community has the type of product that fits that industry. Think about a former coal miner. They are great at troubleshooting, electrical circuitry, heavy machinery. A distillery is not that different. So how much longer is this going to take? This will take, we'll be done with all the remediation over the next four months. So we want the community to support itself, foster new innovation and new businesses, and make folks proud again for their local communities and know that they can make a better life for themselves and their families right where they live. Mary Rachel Redman, Inside Indiana Business. And Coalcraft Spirits is expected to open sometime next year. Also making headlines around Indiana, a Switzerland-based private asset management firm is planning another big solar project in southwest Indiana. Capital Dynamics says a partnership with Nebraska-based Tanaska will produce a 300-megawatt solar farm in Posey County that will create a small number of jobs. The company says the project will be located on up to 3,000 acres with construction to begin next year. The president and CEO of the Northwest Indiana Regional Development Authority is stepping down. Bill Hanna has led the organization for 10 years. He's leaving to become executive director of the Dean and Barbara White Family Foundation in Merrillville. Hanna helped lead many important efforts in the region, including the South Shore Rail Extension and Double Track projects. He also was a leader on initiatives that leverage more than a billion dollars in shoreline development projects. Next, details on Allegiant's most recent acquisition, how it strengthens its market position and strategy for security in a post-COVID world. Well, Allegiant's Indiana workforce is helping bring the company's vision of seamless access as that uh, really becomes increasingly important in a post-COVID world. As part of that aggressive posture, Allegiant has just acquired a privately held technology company, Unomi, to leader in IoT cloud platforms. And I'm pleased to welcome to the show Allegiant Chief Technology Officer Vince Buenos, who has more on the acquisition and how the company's Indiana operations are really playing a key role in some futuristic technology. Vince, welcome to the program. Thanks, Gary. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And to, to tee this up, uh, give us a thumbnail of Allegiant in, in, in Indiana because you're a global company, but do have a significant presence here in Indiana, including about 1,300 employees. You're absolutely right, Gary. We're certainly proud to be part of uh, Indiana business. As you mentioned, over 1,300 employees spanning everything from manufacturing operations on the east side of the city to an engineering and technical center on the northeast side, and of course, our America's Business Center located here in Carmel, Indiana. So we have everything from business strategy, product planning, product road mapping, to the development of those products and the build of those products right here in central Indiana. Yeah, the big manufacturing operation on the east side, part of the old Von Duprin facility, some folks may 
remember. I mentioned this in the intro, Vince, but a big acquisition. You know me, an IoT platform. Talk about that acquisition, why it's important to Allegiant. Yeah, it's critically important to us. You know, you know, he's been a partner of Allegiant since about 2015. We were an investor in the company since about 2017, and their cloud connectivity technology powers our Allegiant connected home or residential electronic deadbolts today. So they are really, when you use a Schlage encode or a Schlage sense lock, um, they are the technology that enables that to come to life and for us to provide the feature sets that we do. And you know the problems they've solved there around uh, the home, uh, home electronics, home ecosystems and home automation really applies more broadly. And we think the technologies they have and have leveraged successfully to benefit us on the residential side, equally important in the the other markets and verticals we serve. Yeah, seamless access and a safer world is uh, kind of a legion's mantra these days. Talk about, because there's amazing technology you guys are involved in, a lot of R&D happening here in Indiana, but in a post-COVID world, that no-touch access that is going to be so important, talk about how a legion and your products and your R&D and all those things fit into that equation. A hey, great question, Gary, happy to, happy to answer. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, as we think about seamless access, our focus there was not just on safety and security, that's always been a cornerstone or foundation of our products and our company, but also starting to think about how do we make the flow of people and assets through spaces more efficient, you know, more productive, hence the seamless or maybe frictionless, if, if that's a better term to use for some people, comes to play. But in a post-COVID world, you know, we also think about touchless as maybe a subset of seamless and providing the ability to come up to an opening. And if it knows you're supposed to have access to automatically open where you don't need to touch anything, mm -hmm. potentially pick up and or transmit germs. Um, you know, we've been in that space with door controls, door closers, uh, automatic door opening and so on for many, many years. And we're certainly happy to have the opportunity to bring those market, bring those products to the market to solve new problems that people are presented with uh, wherever they uh, work, thrive and live. All right, Vince Wainos, the Senior VP and uh, Chief Technology Officer at Allegion, a company, a tech company that is growing its footprint in Indiana, going to be very important in a post-COVID world as well. Vince, uh, as always, thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. All right. Well, when someone finds themselves uh, in a life or death situation in rural Indiana, what kind of health care can they count on? In our next half hour, we'll take a look at legislative efforts to improve trauma care in rural areas around the state. Well, injury is the leading cause of death for Hoosiers under the age of 45. A key weapon to battle these untimely deaths is a robust statewide trauma system, which Hoosier public health leaders say Indiana lacks. Business of Health reporter Kylie Valletta tells us about continued efforts to change that. Kylie. That's right, Gary. Hoosier public leaders say Indiana has several pieces in place for trauma care, but those links aren't connected to form a strong chain that would make up a state trauma care system. However, they're pushing for change. Public health leaders are championing a new bill this legislative session that calls on the state to study Indiana's trauma system. And leading the charge is Meredith Addison, a lifelong ER nurse and Indiana Rural Health Association board member. She joins me now on the show. Meredith, thanks for being on the show today. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Absolutely. But before we talk about the bill, let's talk first about the current status of trauma care here in Indiana. It's inconsistent at best, probably would be the best de description. And a lot of it depends on where you live. And rural uh, areas in Indiana probably face the biggest challenges. Can you explain some of the trauma care challenges that are unique to the rural areas in Indiana? Well, there are things called time sensitive diagnoses. Heart is a time sensitive thing. Stroke is a time sensitive thing. And trauma is the time sensitive thing that deals with the young people. So in years of public or productive life lost, trauma takes out far more than all the others. So it's the time. Right, and with rural areas, uh, they just don't have the close connection to a hospital, right? Well, the hospital may be wonderful, it may be there, 
But do you have cell phone connectivity? Does anybody have a cell phone? Did anybody know that you were out in the pitch black and had some kind of life-threatening injury? So those are the kind of things I'm talking about, the links not being fast and tightly. Okay, so uh, let's talk about this bill. It's being sponsored by House Representative Ann Vermillion. She's uh, from Northeast Indiana. And this bill is to study Indiana's statewide trauma system. Uh, Dr. Paul Halverson, he's throwing his support behind this bill. He's a widely respected name in the state, of course, uh, Dean of the Fairbanks School of Public Health at IU. Uh, explain why is studying the trauma system an important first step? Because we live in Indiana. If we even knew there was a problem, we'd step up and fix it. That's the way Hoosiers roll. But if it's kept in the silo instead of shared in the network, then how did you know your neighbor even needed you or their kid was upside down under their pickup truck? It's a matter of sharing the information, every link of the chain. And so what does it do to have that bill? Does it just help with public awareness, help get the word out? It makes it official. The State Department of Health and the Department of Homeland Security, the State Medical Association, the State Nurses Association, the Emergency Nurses Association, all have public policy platform including this. But it's not all the pieces all the way down to the volunteers at your neighborhood. Right, and just uh, Dr. Paul Haverson, he said uh, this: the statewide trauma a trauma care system needs a serious look for system innovation and modernization. Uh, so there's no funding uh, yet assigned to this effort, but you say a really important ripple effect of this bill uh, could be capturing the attention of some of the deep philanthropic pockets here in Indiana. Explain what you mean by that. Uh, my papa worked at Lilly's for 38 years. He drove a fork truck and he loved what he did. He said Indiana had the deepest philanthropic pockets in the global world until Gates came along. And so we're no slouch. We've got all the pieces of the puzzle we need. We just need a heightened awareness so that your neighbor knows you need your help. So as you know, Indiana is in a deep public health crisis right now. So does the pandemic help your mission in some way? Does it uh, help kind of light the fire for this bill in some way? That's exactly what it did. It illustrated that there are places where there are gaps that people didn't even realize in order to be cell connected, you have to be parked outside somebody else's business in their uh, hot spot or whatever you call it. Well, we've got hot spots in the community and the gaps are where we're losing people. We just need to bring up awareness and tighten up the gaps, link up the links and make everything work. Okay, and Mary, I know you are so passionate about this topic. You've been an ER nurse for, if I'm doing my math correctly, uh, close to 45 years. Um, why is this topic so close to your heart? Why do you care so deeply and want this to happen for the state so badly? I am on the other side of the desk in the place that's open 24-7, 365 days a year. And I have held in my arms what other people don't even have accurate nightmares about. And so we can avoid that for people. And I know people would step up and cough up something to make it work. So it's not a matter of funding. It's a matter of heightened awareness. Okay, we only have about 30 seconds left, uh, Mary, but the same bill died in 2017. What do you think will make it different now in 2021? Dr. Paul Halverson's already done this in Arkansas, and I told him they have just as many jokes about Okies as they do about KC Hoosiers. All we need to do is just shine up the links and link them together, and we've got all the resources we need. We just need to do it. Right. I know Dr. Paul Halverson uh, really um, changed the Arkansas trauma care system, so uh, he's, he's cut his teeth somewhere else. So, Mary, thanks for being on the show today and giving us more insight to this bill, and we'll be following it, and appreciate you being on the show today. Kylie, thank you. Gary, thank you. Absolutely. Gary, back to you. All right, Kylie, thank you. Well, the economic uncertainty brought on by COVID-19 has uh, really escalated an all too familiar fear for those planning to attend college. How can they afford it without racking up massive student debt? Indiana-based nonprofit InvestEd has released its annual survey on the topic and the numbers. Well, they bear out those worries. 89% of Hoosiers value higher education, but a staggering 77% believe the pandemic and economic downturn have really pushed paying for it further out of reach. Invest Ed, Vice President of Marketing Bill Wozniak, has perspective on the hot button issue of college affordability. And Bill, as always, welcome to the program. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. 
Well, I talk, uh, you know, about this brand new survey just out with some numbers that I guess on the one hand you can say maybe not surprising, but they really are striking. Hoosiers value higher education, value the need for it, but that, uh, that cost issue is increasingly a big, big concern. Absolutely. As the pandemic has gone along, as time has gone along, almost eight out of 10 Hoosiers that we surveyed are very concerned about the student loan debt, about the fact that the very important and necessary post-secondary education may now be further out of reach, and, and they don't want that to be the case. Uh, three and four Hoosiers, yeah, concerned uh, about debt. At what point, because everyone wonders, at what point is it going to reach, uh, you know, is, is that out of reach affordability going to really impact the educational process and, and students and young people and others going to, going to college? Well, this is why there's so many paths when we talk about certificates, certificates or we right. talk about community college. We talk about the real examination of the four-year institutions that a student might be considering. All these steps about trying to really find the perfect place to get that education, what is a perfect fit, and then also how to fund it in the best way possible is really one of the ways to alleviate some of these issues. Yeah, one of the interesting uh, results I saw in the survey, or at least I thought so, a large majority of Indiana residents, 83%, say they would prefer to pay for college using a percentage of future income if they had that option. Absolutely. And so when we ask families about how they want to go about this, that is a question that always resonates in a very positive way. And as you know, different things like income share agreements and some of these creative ways to fund education, they're springing up. They're not all across the world everywhere, every school, but they're springing up. And these types of creative solutions are something that's resonating with a lot of Hoosiers, a lot of families. And this is something that we think is going to continue on as the years go by. Yeah, another finding from the survey, uh, Bill, is that uh, respondents believe education benefits their company, benefits their community, benefits their state. So there's that correlation. It's a big expense uh, many times. But companies, communities, and others see value in what education brings. When we ask the respondents what do they think about the value of this for their area, their town, their, their business, as you mentioned, it pulls very, very highly. People believe not only is it good for an individual, but it's good for the community. It's good for the business. It's good for the town, and it's good for the state. And so you can see how really in very strong numbers, people believe that this is something that's going to strengthen all the different groups. I'm sure one of the results as we wrap up here that you were happy to see is that a respondent saying they really value these free services and the, the, uh, the access to information about education and funding ed education. Always been important, but it would seem to me nowadays that it's, it's critical. When we're at the schools or we're at the different places helping families, we see the gratitude. We see how people are very thankful for the help, the, the, the information so that they can move along with this post-secondary education. But now, as you mentioned, more than ever, people want that, and we're happy to provide that. Very interesting survey results uh, on the value of education and also the cost of education continues to be a hot button issue. Bill Wozniak from uh, Invest Ed, uh, really appreciate uh, you being with us and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Gary. All right. Well, Fisher's based Cool Revolution took home top honors on a new business pitch competition TV show. The sleepwear startup last week appeared on Two Minute Drill on Bloomberg TV and was awarded $50,000 in cash and prizes for winning that competition. Cool Revolution makes a line of cooling pajamas from a bamboo-based material for women going through menopause-related night sweats. Co-founder Laura Musall made the pitch for her company on the show. And the company says in addition to the cash, the top prize includes a coaching with entrepreneur David Meltzer, who created and hosts Two Minute Drill. Up next, buckle in for something that's never happened at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, cars whipping around the track without drivers. Introducing the Indy Autonomous Challenge, a million dollar high speed autonomous vehicle race. 
Hundreds of college students from around the globe gearing up for the world's first head-to-head -head driverless car race. We'll explain the technology behind the Indy Autonomous Challenge and how it could have big implications for car buying down the road. For more than a century, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway has pushed the limits of innovation, safety, and speed. And that innovation will be on display yet again at the Brickyard when hundreds of college students from around the globe gather in October for the Indy Autonomous Challenge. Now, it's the world's first high-speed, head-to-head, driverless car race. With a lot of money on the line as well, the uh, total purse at more than $1.5 million. Now, the Indy Autonomous Challenge will put the innovation spotlight on Indiana, and the engineering and innovation could someday lead to commercialization of fully driverless vehicles. And I'm pleased this week to be joined by Indianapolis Motor Speedway President Doug Bowles and Energy Systems Network CEO Paul Mitchell, co-organizers of the event, who are going to talk about what uh, I think is just an amazing event. And gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I want to talk about uh, you unveiled the car this week. But first of all, Doug, this is very futuristic, very technology focused. But yet it really does get back to the roots and the history and the heritage of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. You know, you're right. It's really strange, right? It is about the future. It is about the future of automation and transportation. But it's really why the Indianapolis Motor Speedway was created 111 years ago when Carl Fisher and his partners built the Speedway. It was to test the new technology of the day and really try and advance the way that we moved people uh, throughout commerce and, and entertain them at the same time. So to partner with ESN on the Indy Autonomous Challenge is just a, an extension, really, of the dream that Carl Fisher had in 1909 when he built the Speedway. Yeah. Uh, Paul, give us a thumbnail description of this event, driverless ca cars. You unveiled the, uh, the official car, if you will, the uh, Indy car, a very different looking. Uh, I mean, it looks like an Indy car, but with no cockpit, no driver, a lot of technology. Give us a thumbnail description, Paul, of the Indy, uh, uh, Indy Autonomous Challenge. Absolutely, Gary. So we've got 30 teams, the best and brightest minds from around the world representing 30 different 30 plus different world-class research universities competing. It's a million dollar prize competition. They're gonna run fully autonomous vehicles uh, for 20 laps, that's 50 miles around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, uh, head to head. So the vehicles will be out there racing against each other. Um, and the winner goes home with a million dollar prize. You know, so it's, it's a very uh, high stakes, but also extremely cutting edge. I mean, we are pushing automation to the absolute limit uh, through this competition. Yeah. Well, and these cars, uh, they're not going to be, uh, they're going to really be scooting around the speedway, right? How fast are these cars going to go? So these are these are real race cars. I mean, for those people who are Indy 500 fans and been out to the speedway, they, they know that you got to have speed if you're going to be at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And so these vehicles will be going 180, pushing 200 miles an hour um, in, in, a, in a real open wheel race car that will look familiar, except that there'll be no driver in it. It'll be, it'll be operated entirely by the computer and really the robot driver, if you will, that's inside that vehicle. Yeah, Doug, talk about the vehicle because you look at it, it's a really cool looking car, an Indy car, but again, no, no driver, no cockpit. But talk about it, it's amazing technology. Operating the vehicle, and it's not just sit programming it to go around the track once, it's programming around it to go around the track for 50 miles at 180 miles per hour plus with other cars <laughs> and trying to figure out how to navigate and be the first car to cross the yard of bricks. So the technology is really, really impressive in this. And I can't wait to see what these university students are able to do with these race cars. Yeah, bringing great talented university students here. Paul, talk about the impact that this will have in your view, kind of off the track, if you will, this focus on innovation and entrepreneurship and technology uh, and what's going to happen at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. That focus comes from around the world, again, back here in Indiana. And it kind of reflects, as you look at, uh, here's Indiana, a state that's doing this kind of thing, may have some residual impact with, with corporate America, companies around the globe as they look at uh, in innovation and Indiana. 
Well, there's there's no hotter topic in industry and innovation than AI, data, artificial intelligence, data analytics, and this is really an AI race. So the the universities and the team members that are competing, uh, they're not just going to go into the automotive industry. Certainly, some of them will, and I know probably some of them will wind up working uh, for teams that race in the Indy 500. But what our hope is is that this will lead to uh, connecting this talent base to all of the industries across the state of Indiana that are looking for, for AI talent and create new relationships and linkages between these universities, this pool of entrepreneurial students and the Hoosier State for years to come. Very good, and we've only got about 45 seconds left, but Doug, uh, can't let you get away with that. There's going to be a little race between now and uh, October, the Indy Autonomous Challenge. The Indianapolis 500, your thoughts now? Last year, a very difficult year, obviously. Mm -hmm. A lot of questions still about, hey, what's, what's going to happen? Your thoughts as uh, we're now just a few months away from May. Well, we're certainly hoping we can have the Indy 500 in May with fans. We're right. working towards that. That's what the team is focused on. We're just going to have to see how things play out here over the next few weeks with the vaccine. But we're really hopeful that this year we can open the gates in May. Look forward to that and look forward to the Indy Autonomous Challenge. Going to be an amazing event in October. Uh, can't wait to see it. Paul Mitchell, Energy Systems Network, Doug Bowles, Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Thank you both. I know we'll be doing more stories on this between now and October. Thanks, Thanks Gary. Gary. All right. Well, the ball has officially been passed as the city prepares to host the 2022 College Football Playoff National Championship game at Lucas Oil Stadium. During a virtual handoff ceremony this week, Indy CFP Host Committee Board Chair Mark Howell said the event could generate $150 million in economic impact. And assuming the public health environment has returned to normal, more than 100,000 fans could descend upon downtown Indianapolis for that four-day event. The committee is also calling for between 1,500 and 2,000 volunteers who will be needed. Additionally, the Indy Championship Fund announced it has reached its fundraising goal of $25 million for big-time Indy sporting events, including the CFP National Championship. Well, a familiar Indiana face in government and philanthropy is putting his stamp on the next generation of corporate and nonprofit leaders. I'll be joined next by an Indiana business and political icon, former Indiana Lieutenant Governor John Mutz. Also, Indiana Philanthropy Alliance CEO Claudia Cummins with details on a new leadership institute and its mission to build strong philanthropic leaders. Well, an Indianapolis-based philanthropic organization is honoring and uh, leaning on the past a bit to create a future generation of charitable corporate leaders in Indiana. The Indiana Philanthropy Alliance has announced the Mutz Leadership Institute in honor of former Indiana Lieutenant Governor John Mutz. It's an educational platform designed to help train current and future executives for roles at foundations uh, or corporate giving institutions. And with more on uh, the institution, pleased to be joined by John Mutz and also Indiana Philanthropy Alliance CEO Claudia Cummings. And welcome to you both. Thank you. Absolutely. Claudia, I'll start with you. Um, give us a thumbnail description of the Indiana Philanthropy Alliance and, and how it fits really into a, a larger picture of a, of a city and a state that is really focused and has a rich heritage when it comes to philanthropy and giving. Yeah, Indianapolis and Indiana in total are really unique in the national landscape in the philanthropic field. We have, um, in, the IPA has over 200 members and they're located throughout the, the state. We have one community foundation in every one of the 92 counties in the state. And um, together with the private philanthropic efforts that are underway through the large larger organizations like Follinger and um, Lilly Endowment and others, um, coupled with the corporate philanthropic community, we see over an $850 million impact annually in the state of Indiana. Wow. We also are home to the nation's first and strongest school of philanthropy um, and so many other uh, rich assets that make us unique in the nation. 
Yeah, Claudia, talk about the Mutz Philanthropic Leadership Institute. It, it recognizes really an iconic business and political community leader in our state. What are you trying to accomplish? Uh, what will be accomplished in your view with this, uh, with this institute? Yeah, well, um, last year we worked on our strategic plan and we interviewed uh, philanthropy organizations across the state and learned one of the greatest pain points is the future talent. Um, we need a new wave of strong leadership in order to continue to advance social impact throughout the state of Indiana. And we simultaneously were celebrating our 30th anniversary. So it made it a really great time to celebrate our past and our founding by John Mutz while preparing our future through the creation of this opportunity for emerging leaders and those that exist in leadership but are looking to level up. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that first uh, class uh, in a moment here. But, John, why is this important to you? You know, in my opinion, there are few that rival the contributions that you've made uh, over the years in business, in politics, philanthropy, community support. You've done a lot of things. Why is, is giving back in this way uh, with the Philanthropic Leadership Institute important to you? It's important to me because we are training and hoping to train a new wave of leaders for the philanthropic organizations across the state. And this is a new wave of people who will better understand how much can be accomplished uh, in the philanthropic sector. For example, uh, we will be able to have in every county, just because there's a community foundation there, they are the ideal organization to call the meeting. They're the ones who bring the community together to talk about opportunities and problems and what they can plan for in the, the future. Uh, those are reasons I care about it in terms of community development. But overall, I think for a democracy, to endure, as we have in the United States. I know there's a lot of people questioning that right now with what's going on. But the, factor, the fact is that I don't believe a democracy can succeed long term without an independent sector, a philanthropic sector that gives those who are not heard any way, any other way, a way to express themselves yeah. as far as society. Yeah, well, well put. Uh, Claudia, very quickly, you're, you're just introducing your new, your first class. What are they going to be doing? What are some of the experiences they'll be getting? Yeah, this class represents um, every corner of the state. We're super excited about them. They are going to be having a cohort style monthly experience where they will focus on different topics. Uh, first up is the history of philanthropy and uh, what's next on the horizon nationwide for the field. Very good. Only have a few uh, seconds left, but uh, John, before we go, I do want to mention anyone looking for a great read, there's a new book out uh, on uh, John Mutch, your life examined. Uh, basically, I had the good fortune to cover you as a news reporter, a cub reporter back in the day and uh, covered a lot of big stories uh, around things you were doing. This book really does chronicle some cool things that happened in Indiana and you were a big part of it. Well, I appreciate that a great deal. Uh, I'm also honored by uh, the philanthropic sector to put my name on, on this this program. Uh, it's something I care deeply about. It's important to the future of the state. Very good. Well, it's going to have an impact, I am sure. The Mutz Philanthropic Leadership Institute. John Mutz, also Claudia Cummins, the president and CEO of the Indiana Philanthropy Alliance. Thank you both for joining us. We'll talk to you soon. Our pleasure. Okay. Well, I'll be right back after this. Stay with us. That's all the time we have for this week. I'm Gary Dick. Go out and make it a successful week. Inside Indiana Business with Gary Dick is a production of Grow Indiana Media Ventures with support from WFYI Productions.